The Gallup poll in 2014 reported that 77% of adult Americans profess, self-profess to be Christians. That, that two-thirds, more than two-thirds of our entire nation identify themselves to be Christians. The word Christian means Christ-like. But as we look at our nation in its morality and the way that our country is headed in the direction and what's taking place all over our nation with, with the, the perversity and the rioting and everything that's taking place around our nation, really as we look at our society and our communities, are two-thirds or more than two-thirds, 77% of our nation, are, are they really Christians? You know, it would, it would be evident, wouldn't it, if that was true. Those that proclaim to be Christians, if they really were, it would be evident. Here's how you would see it, as John says in our text today, in the way that they love one another. It would be so evident when you get on the freeway in bumper-to-bumper traffic during rush hour, and, and there's a long line on the on-ramp, and, and you're there, and more people are trying to get on the freeway right in front of you as cars are piling up, it would be so evident that everybody, or 77% of those that were Christians on the freeway, why? Great, more people joining in. Great, yeah, come on in. Yeah, another one, great. Oh, five more, perfect. Hey, brother, hey, sister, great to see you. There would be a unity on the freeway we would all be going in the same direction. And it would be great because all those that aren't going on the same direction, we would worry about them. There there would be a joy amongst the people. There would be a love so evident, not only on the freeway during rush hour, but also in your workplace, In, in anywhere you go, anywhere you experience. There would be so many people as Christians, it would be so evident in their love, but we don't see that. We don't see the love of Jesus being shown in our communities, in our society, in our nation, and in the world. You see, there's one underlying piece of evidence, one underlying action that we must have, that must be present in a person's life that claims to be a born-again Christian, that truly says, I am Christ-like, and that is love. To be like Christ, how do we know that we have Christ? How do we know that we are right with Christ? How do we know that we are truly born again? Jesus Christ gave us the answer in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. I'll read it to you, or you can follow along on the screen. But if you're a note taker, write it down for your own study. John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, I'm gonna take this to the next level. And the next level, this new commandment I'm going to give to you is that you would love your brothers and sisters and the family of God, everyone, but specifically the family of God in the way that I've loved you. We know, if you've been a born-again Christian, we know the love that Jesus has for us. So much so that he would lay his life down for us. Willingly sacrifice, surrender self for others. Agape love, unconditional love. That's the love that Jesus has shown to us. And he says, this is how the world that's looking on and the believers that are around will know that you are truly my disciple, that you are truly Christ-like, that you're truly part of my family, a part of the family of God. Here's how one word, love, love. It's the most fundamental most basic principle that should be manifest in a believer's life. And John gives us a 
important key about this love and what will happen in the body of Christ when we have this love. John says this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. This is how you know that the evidence or that you can realize or see that someone is a child of God. This is how you know that you're truly born again. This is how we can know if someone else is truly born again or if they're not born again, if they're of the family of God or if they're of the family of the devil. Here's how you know. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. This is the litmus test. This is the indication that we are of God in the way that we love each other, church, in the way that we look out for one another, in the way that we get each other's backs and encourage each other and love on each other, even when that person doesn't deserve it, even when, when they, they aren't being lovable, even when we show that agape love, that unconditional love that Christ showed us. And in order to show that love, you have to first receive that love from God. You cannot show the love of God unless you've first experienced the love of God. And when you experience the love of God, how can we in our lives not show that love of God to each other? Well, they don't deserve it. Hey, newsflash, neither did you. You didn't deserve it when Christ died for you because he died for you, Romans 5, 8, while you were still sinning. You didn't deserve that love when Christ did it for you and showed that love. And so too, we are to show that love to each other even when they don't deserve it. That love manifests itself in action towards each other. It's the indication that we are part of the family of God and the way that we love one another. Those who do not love their brother, John says, their sister, talking about those that are part of the family of God, the believers, the born again Christians. John says they are not of God nor are you a disciple of God. If we are not living in love towards each other, if we aren't showing love to each other unconditionally, then John makes it crystal clear. There is a, there is a very important point that's wrong in our lives. There's, there's a fundamental failure in our lives. If we do not love and have that love, for one another. If we're not living in love towards Christians, then we are not assured by any means that we even are Christians. For if you are part of the family, then yes, as you know, in your family, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your children, they failed you. There's times that they've done things wrong to you. But what do you do when someone else that's not in your family or that's maybe a distant relative that's in your family begins to talk bad about your family? What do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You get their back. The reason why is because they're family and nobody messes with family. La familia for my Spanish friends. It's the word that's used to describe, I mean, if you've ever seen Fast and Furious, you know nobody messes with family. There's a bond that's there. And so too in the family of God, there's a bond that needs to take place in the way that we love each other, in the way that we're there for each other. So John goes on to say in verse 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. John is saying this, it's the evidence in your life that you belong to Jesus Christ. It's the evidence in your life that you've been born again as a Christian. It's the evidence in your life that you've received Jesus Christ and the love that he's shown because if you received his love, then how can we not show his love? It's the evidence. And John gives the example now of a person that doesn't show the love of God. He says in verse 12, not as Cain, 
who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Now, John gives an example of one that does not love his brother and the reason why he doesn't love his brother. And he uses the story of a family, Cain and Abel, who were biological brothers. And you won't really be able to fully understand what John is saying unless you are familiar with this story. That's found in Genesis chapter four, where it talks about how Cain and Abel, who were the two sons of Adam and Eve, the two firstborn of Adam and Eve, Cain being the oldest and Abel the next, and how it came a time in their lives to bring a sacrifice to God, to give of their sacrifice to the Lord. And as they did that, it says that Cain's sacrifice was rejected, but Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Now in Genesis chapter four, it does not give us the reason why, but when Cain realized his brother's sacrifice was accepted by God and was pleasing to God, but his work was not, he was filled with envy and bitterness and hatred and threatened by his younger brother Abel. So much so that Cain, because of the bitterness and envy and resentment towards his brother, because God accepted what his brother was doing but didn't accept what he was doing, he was filled with so much hatred, he ended up taking his brother's life. So we're not told in Genesis chapter four that why the offering was received, but just what was the outcome of when Cain's offering wasn't received. But you see, we get a key in Proverbs Chapter 21, verse 27, it says this, the sacrifice of an evil person is detestable, especially when it's offered with the wrong motives. So Cain offered, but the offering was detestable to God because Cain was not right with God. And then John caps it off and ties it all together by telling us in verse 12 that Cain's works were evil. So Cain's sacrifice to God was not received by God because Cain's works were evil. He had the wrong motives. He didn't have the right heart in giving to God. And do you know the same is true for us in the family of God? That if we give to God in, in giving financially or if we give to God in service to him in the church and we give to God with the wrong motives or that we have a wicked heart, Within our hearts, we will develop envy and bitterness and resentment towards others that are in our family, that are serving God with the right hearts because we have the wrong hearts. And so Cain took his brother's life, was filled with, with all sorts of characteristics that are not of God. Because his brother was serving with the right heart, Cain with the wrong hearts. John is using this story of that family as a picture of this family, the family of God. When a person has the wrong motives, serving God, and when someone else is serving God with the right motives, do you know that you will find yourself jealous of them and how God is using them? You will find yourself bitter towards them. You will find yourself resenting them. Your brother, your sister, in the family of God. Because, according to John chapter three, because our motives are wrong. Because we have the wrong heart. It's filled with wickedness and evil. Listen, like Cain, if you are serving God, giving to God with the wrong hearts, you will inevitably be envious of others that are doing it with the right hearts. People, listen, do not talk bad about a brother or a sister, a family of God, people do not speak negatively of another person when they have the right heart. When you, when you love God and have his heart, you will not be able to talk negatively about another child of God, a brother or sister in the family. For when we are right with God, we will be loving our brother, 1 John 3.10. Who does a person talk bad about then? Who does a person find fault with? It's a person that 
They are envious of, bitter towards, threatened by, or jealous of. No person with a half a heart would, would badmouth someone that has a mental disability. Someone, someone that is mentally disabled, no person with a half a heart, when they would walk out of the room, would, would, would start making accusations towards them or threatening them or talking bad about them or putting them down. Why? Because there's something with, with someone that isn't a threat or, or isn't, you know, isn't, isn't uh, you know, uh, a threat to us to take our place or our position. We're not threatened by them, so there's no need to talk bad about that person. But here's the person that we talk bad about. It's the person that we're threatened by, envious of, jealous of. The person that God is blessing in what they're doing and how they're giving it to the Lord, like Abel was blessed by God. And Cain resented his brother because he saw his brother being blessed and his sacrifices weren't received because he had a wrong heart to begin with. The person that's blessed by God, when we see them, we are more vulnerable. We are more vulnerable to make accusations against them, attack them, try to cut them down. So a person like Cain will attack his brother out of those wrong motives. How do we attack them? How do we kill them? By stabbing them in the back. We attack them with our words, with the things that we say, attacking their character, attacking their motives, attacking their actions, and we can talk bad about each other, and we are killing that person. We're destroying them by the words that come out of our mouth. Listen, if a person can cut someone down to their level, it makes that person feel that they can get ahead of that person or have a head over that person. If they can cut that person down to their level, then it makes them look just as big. But do you know something? It never works that way. Never does it work that way. If you find yourself talking negatively about another family member, another pastor, another ministry, if you are one always talking negatively about others, mark my words, people will think negatively of you. That's how it always happens. Because eventually, as the Bible says, the truth will be made known. And when people try to slander or cut a brother or sister, and tear them down so that they would look bigger, when the truth is made known, and when people realize, okay, that wasn't completely true, and that person was just being negative or finding fault, and when the truth is made known, they'll realize the person that has the problem was the person that was spreading the rumors. And people will know the truth, they'll see the truth, and then they'll realize, what's wrong with that person? That he would say such things about that person, because now that I know the truth about this person and how they just love the Lord, that person that was talking bad, they're the one that has the issue. You see, talking bad about someone in the family of God always backfires. Luke chapter eight, verse 17 says this, for all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. The person that's doing the chopping, the person that comes out with the rumor or the person that says wrongful things about someone will always be recognized as the person, the one that has the problem. Cain's disobedience and hatred, it also made him miserable. Not only does it show his heart, that his heart was wicked, that his heart was evil, it showed that he was the person with the problem, but it also made him miserable. Genesis chapter four, verse five, it says this, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. People that do not love others often are miserable being around themselves. People that do not love others often are miserable having to be around themselves. Listen, if someone's being negative and someone's just, just, just always criticizing and finding fault, you, you will realize if you are that type of person, people will begin to repel from you. Because they, they don't want to be, that's not attractive. That doesn't, that doesn't draw people just always finding the fault and, the, and, and always being filled with negativity. And so you will find yourself alone. But then you know what will happen? 
you'll get sick of yourself too. <laughs> you'll, you'll be so miserable with all the negative lifestyle that you are living that you'll wish that you could get away from yourself too, but you can't. You're stuck with yourself. You can't get away from yourself. You're just, you're just negative, and, and you will realize that not only because you don't have love for others in the way that you live, you'll find yourself not loving in the way that you ought to as well. You'll find yourself being miserable. Whenever we try to cut people down to your size, it only shows how small we really were in comparison. Whenever we try to chop someone, cut someone down, it only shows how small we are in comparison. Listen, if we are one that throws dirt, talks negatively, doesn't show the love of God for those people, if we throw dirt, listen, we're only going to lose ground. Wait for it. If we're throwing dirt, we're losing ground. Listen, then what should we do? How should we live? It's pictured perfectly in the family of Noah. After the flood, Noah fell into sin. He got drunk and then was naked, passed out nakedly. And, and one of his sons exposed his nakedness, exposed his sin, and then came out talking bad about his dad. Hey, guess what? Dad's in here. He's drunk off his rocker. He, he's naked being a fault finder, pointing out Noah's failure. But do you know who was blessed in the story? It wasn't that son. It was the other sons that took a blanket, walked backwards into the tent so that his nakedness wouldn't be seen and covered their father. Listen, the ones that are blessed in life are ones that love another and cover them that get each other's backs and look out for each other, to cover them in love. A person that truly loves isn't one that's proclaiming someone's faults, it's someone that's dealing with their faults. One that truly loves, a person that really loves each other isn't gonna be one that's shouting from the rooftops, what I don't like or what I think about this, it's someone that will cover them just as Noah's sons covered him. Listen, when we love one another, it will be manifest in the way that we talk about each other. And you can know that you are a believer, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life. We know that we've gone out of our, our sinful ways and come into new life in Jesus Christ. We know this because we love the brethren. There's something natural within our, our nature, our human nature, our fleshly nature, that wants to hear the negative, that wants to talk about the negative. There's something within our nature. And so when people, the world, and other people see you, and, and you're never finding fault, and when they bring up the negative, you don't listen to it, and you're just positive about those things, they'll realize that there's something different about you. They'll realize that, that you've come into that new life in Jesus Christ because in the way that you love the brethren, you can know that you are a believer. You can know that you are walking with the Lord because of the way that we love one another. Here's one of the key ways for you and for me. Those that would say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm worried. I, am I born again? Am I concerned? I'm concerned, you know, am I secure in my salvation? Am I part of the family of God? People ask me, I ask them this question, do you love God? Yes. Do you love the family of God? Yes. Then you can know that you are part of the family because you are loving the family. When you, when you wanna stand up for them, like Noah's two sons did for him. When someone comes to you and says, you know what, I don't really like this about that person or I don't really care for this about that pastor or I don't really like this thing that's going on. The person that stands up right there in that moment and says, you know what, that's negative. That's, that's detrimental. And so, you know what, I don't even wanna hear that. I don't even wanna hear you talk negatively about that person because that's my brother that's my sister, and nobody talks bad about my brother or my sister. And the person that stands up right there that loves their brother will then destroy 
any active negativity that would be going on through the body or in the family. And, and then that person will then go to the next person because you, they know you don't want to hear it. So they'll go to the next person. And when that person stands up right there on the spot and says, you know what, I don't want to hear this. You're talking bad about my brother. You're talking bad about my sister. And I'm not even gonna listen to this. Matthew 18, if they've offended you, you need to go to them. And by coming to me, you're gossiping and I will not listen to gossip. I will not hear it. And if everybody did that and had their brothers and their sisters backs, instead of looking at their backs to see where you can place the knife, looking at their backs to see how you can get their backs, and when every single person does that in the family, listen, there is no room for any negativity. There's no room for any division. There's no room to attack each other because we are all filled with love and we get each other's backs. What do people do? What do we do when people are spreading poison, talking bad about somebody? I said it right then, we stand up right there on the spot. And then we beat them up. No, I'm kidding, we don't. Here's what we do. Here's the answer. Here's how to, to make sure we give no room to the enemy. It's Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20. Without food, a fire goes out. Without the, the food for the fire, or another translation puts it this way, without wood, a fire goes out, and without gossip, a quarrel dies down. Here's what we do. We refuse to respond. If you, if I, if we refuse to give an ear to those that would try to be starting a fire, listen, the fire will burn out. If we, our lives, that's represented in this verse by wood, if we don't allow more people to be a part of that fire, the fire will burn out. And so too, if we say, I will not listen to that. I will not listen to that gossip. I will not listen to that negative word, nor will I believe it or even entertain that thought. I will not. When we do that, we destroy the work of the enemy because we love each other more than we want to hear what's negative about each other. And that doesn't only go for us in the family of God in this church, but all the church in your family, specifically in the workplace, wherever you go, you will be known that you are a disciple of God in the way that you love one another. We refuse to respond. And that's why Jesus says this in Mark chapter four, verse 24, take heed what you hear. It's important, church, that we don't give ear to those that would seek to slander another believer, another brother or sister. For most of us, we would say, oh, I would never talk bad about another person. I, I, I'm not that type of person. I would never do that. But we will listen if someone else is talking. And we want to hear because we want to know the inside scoop of what's going on. We, we want to know those things and hear those things. But listen, if we are listening to people say things that are negative, things that are detrimental, things that are hurtful about another believer, if we're listening to it, we are just as guilty as the one that's speaking it because we are throwing wood into the fire by allowing it. In listening to gossip, negative words, we are equally responsible. So when we walk in love towards each other, that agape love, and we talk in love about our family members, it's proof that we are a believer. It's proof. So let me ask you this question. What is going to win in your life individually, in our church congregationally, in your workplace, in your campus? What's going to win? Negative words, detrimental words, or love? What's going to win? May it be true for us in our lives that we will allow love to dominate our lives because we are ones that have received Christ's love. What is love? What is love? First Corinthians chapter 13 gives the definition of love. 
And it gives multiple definitions of what love is, but I want to share one with you. It says this, love doesn't notice when other people do things incorrectly. Just like Noah's sons knew that their dad sinned, but covered him, didn't expose it and proclaim it to everybody. Hey, did you hear? Did you hear what happened to Noah? You know, that man of faith who built the ark, I guess what he's doing now. No, but covered it and dealt with it. They were the ones that were blessed by God. And the ones that aren't blessed, listen, if you want to live a blessed life, hashtag blessed, if you want to be one that is blessed by God, then we are to be those that love one another and those that love each other, love the brethren, love the family of God. Those are the ones that will be blessed. Love doesn't notice when other people do things incorrectly. Whenever I, whenever you, whenever we, whenever anyone is critical, it's because that person is not walking in love. Whenever we find ourselves finding fault or noticing that someone didn't do something in the way that they should have done it, it's that we aren't walking in love, which is evidence that we are not filled with the Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is singular love. And when we are lacking in love, it's evidence that we are lacking the presence of God in our lives. If you want to be one that's blessed by God, then we need to be one that's walking in the Spirit. And when we're walking in the Spirit, we will then be walking in love. There's an old theologian that I shared from before who shared profound truths. He was from 1942. His name was Thumper. He was in a movie called Bambi. And he shared this profound truth as a theologian, and he said, if you don't have anything nice to say, then, oh, you've, you've heard of him, then don't say anything at all. And do you know that is a profound truth? If we are Christians that are walking in love towards each other, walking in love, filled with the Spirit, we will be one that are looking for the good and not pointing out the bad. Listen, no monument has ever been built, erected to honor a critic. Never one. Every monument that's ever been built to remember someone has been for someone that has tried to do something great and either did it or failed at it or were behind it and supporting it. But never one monument that was there built to remember someone that says they were a critic. It's always to honor those that were a part of the work of God. Listen, we need to make sure that we in our lives are building each other up, honoring people. How, how do we get there? What's the solution to make sure that we are? Proverbs says it this way, the power of life and death is in the power of your speech. Here's the key. We can either be praying on people, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, praying on people or praying for people. So when people do things wrong to you, when people say things wrong, act wrong, here's the key. If we are busy praying for them to God, we will not be busy praying on them to others. If we are so busy praying for them because they need the prayer, obviously, they need all the prayer they can get. And if we fill our words with prayer for them, blessings on them, listen, two things will happen. God will change them. But the second thing is this, God will change you. Jesus did this on the cross. Here's how to make sure that our heart continues to love people in the family of God. Jesus did it on the cross. He said, Father, in prayer, forgive them who are spitting on me, who are whipping me, who are killing me, literally, who have beaten me, who are mocking me, who are talking bad about me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And in prayer, even on the cross, Jesus was able to cultivate a love for those people that were doing the worst to him so that he would continue to have the right heart towards them and would die for them. And so too in prayer, in the prayers that we pray for that person that just drives that spike into our side, 
that person that's mocking us to our face, the person that's talking bad about us behind our back. We pray blessings on them. Father, forgive them. They don't deserve it, so bless them with forgiveness. And when we pray for those people who do wrong, listen, God will work in them and change their hearts, but he will also work in our hearts. And when we are praying blessings for people, we will not find ourselves talking bad about people. When we are praying for people, we won't be praying on people. That's the answer. That's the key. Walk in love. How do I love that person? Pray for them. And God will cultivate a love within your heart as you ask the Spirit to come in, to fill you, to show that supernatural love that he's given to you and that that would work through you. It all comes back to love. This is the mark, church. Not the Christian t-shirt that you wear. Not the Regenerate sticker you have on your car. Not in the Christian lingo that you speak. But this is a mark that you are a disciple of God. By this, all people will know that you are my disciple in the way that you love one another. May we be a church that loves each other and gets each other's backs. And when someone tries to say something negative about some ministry, about some pastor, about me, about you, may we be ones that say, you know what? I don't wanna hear that. If you have a problem, you need to go and talk to them in Jesus' name. May we be a church that loves each other. Amen? Amen. Amen.